Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, December 26th, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from the Fablemans, editor Michael Kahn. By the time he still showed it, we had the whole show cut. So it's not a matter of us managing this or that. We get together and see if he shares our feeling, because we don't always do exactly what he wants. We do what we feel. And editor Sarah Brocher. It's funny because it was sort of easy to forget that it was Steven. It felt like a character in a movie that we were editing. You know, it was more that sometimes he would look a particular way and you'd get a glimpse and you're like, oh my gosh, that's Steven as a young man. Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Okay, here we go. Final rough cut of 2022. I guess I didn't get a break after all. That's cool. Don't need one. Love doing this. I hope you love hearing it. And how could you not with guests like we have today? Editors Michael Kahn and Sarah Brozier from The Fablemans. As I'm sure you know, The Fablemans is Steven Spielberg's semi-autobiographical take on his formative years, where he discovered his love of filmmaking while at the same time dealing with the demise of his parents' marriage. And I have to say, after talking with Michael and Sarah... I don't know how semi-autobiographical it is. By their account, it's a pretty accurate representation. Regardless of how accurate, the film is a fascinating look at someone whose work we have all enjoyed for many years. Sarah and Michael have been working together for about 16 years. I think Sarah's first film with Michael was called Ten Items or Less, released back in 2006. Sarah was an apprentice on that one, but it was not a Spielberg film. Rather, it was written and directed by Brad Silberling. It would be five more years before Sarah would work with Michael and Steven on Spielberg's The Adventures of Tintin. And then it was Spielberg's film The Post where Sarah would take on co-editorial duties with Mr. Khan, as she has on Spielberg's subsequent films Ready Player One, West Side Story, and now The Fablemans. And how Sarah and Michael co-edit is pretty interesting. I think you'll get a kick out of that. Now, as far as Michael Khan's resume goes, well, how much time you got? It's just, wow. He first worked with Spielberg on Close Encounters of the Third Kind in 1977. And then from there, he won Oscars for Raiders of the Lost Ark, Schindler's List, and Saving Private Ryan. And if we ended it right there, that would be quite a career. But obviously, there is so much more. Let's just summarize by saying, Michael is a very accomplished editor, filmmaker, and storyteller. So there is definitely lots to talk about with Sarah and Michael about the Fablemans, about their careers, and of course, about the craft of editing. But before we do, please give me a moment of your time to learn about extreme music, those folks who are so kind to sponsor this podcast. Now let me ask you, are you Steven Spielberg? Of course not. Unless you are, which would be amazing. And in that case, thank you, Mr. Spielberg, for checking out the podcast. I'm a big fan. But presuming you're not him, I bet you all love to tell great stories like he does, in either the film or TV mediums. Something that young Sammy Fableman, a.k.a. Steven Spielberg, learns making his first film is that music is what saves the film from being fake, totally fake. And you probably already know that, too. So when you're looking for the best production audio for your next amazing story, get it, amazing story, look no further than Extreme Music. They have an enormous catalog of great music from elite musicians and composers. And that catalog could not be easier to peruse thanks to their incredible search engine that allows you to search on musical qualities like tempo and instrumentation. You just need to tell Extreme Music what you're looking for. Or actually upload a reference track to them and they can use that to find just what you need. So simple, yet so very powerful. You can get it all done right there online, or one of their reps can reach out and lend a hand if you need it. So the next time you have a great story to tell, tell it with great tracks from Extreme Music. Okay then, time for today's main attraction. From Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, here are editors Michael Kahn and Sarah Brocher. Always moving forward, never looking back. I think I should do that. Maybe you should. You should be a major producer in this town. I can see it all now. <laughs> We're standing in front of the theater, <laughs> and your face is on a marquee. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears, Michael. <laughs> you know, Mr. Kahn, with your rich background and your history with Mr. Spielberg, it feels like you've done just about everything you could do before, except for edit a movie that's based on the director you're working with, someone you've worked with for over 40 years. How is working on The Fablemans different for you in that it is, in large part, Stephen's story? Well, I think that Steve's job, he had two jobs, one to direct it, and then after the direction, he would come in with us and select takes. And he was much more careful with what he selected because it's his life, it's the people that he knows. So as we went into the show, he spent more time looking at the show. So almost every day he'd look at the show once, 
sometimes twice a day, just to see if there's anything that shouldn't be there. He was very careful about that. So the show you see is the show he wanted. And he was pretty emotional in certain areas of it, as anybody would be when you're talking about your parents. And I thought Stephen did a hell of a job in the show. It was, it, we enjoyed editing it. It was a lot of fun. Having known him for as long as you both have, when you're looking at these performances, certainly of Sammy Fableman's, are you thinking in the back of your head, like, well, that's not how Stephen would say it, or that's not how Stephen would react? I don't think so. I never, it's funny because it was sort of easy to forget that it was Steven. It felt like a character in a movie that we were editing and it felt, you know, it was more that sometimes he would look a particular way and you'd get a glimpse and you're like, oh my gosh, that's Steven as a young man, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was more like you're you're watching these characters and we're, you're invested in the, the movie as a movie and the characters as the characters on screen. And then you'd get hit with these little flashes that reminded you who the story is really about. So Sarah, when you know that you're going to be doing this project, and certainly one as unique as this one, what do you do to prepare for it? I think you just make sure you're well rested, <laughs> right? <laughs> Show up well rested and ready to ready to go to work. And, um, you know, this movie was funny because it was the first film that we did right after COVID. So we all had said goodbye to each other on a Friday morning in March of 2020. And then this is the next time we saw each other was a week before shooting, we all come back to the cutting room. And so it was, you know, it had been a long break where we had done some of West Side Story remotely at home, but we hadn't been in a room together for a really long time. So it was pretty exciting to come back and get back to work for sure. Now, were you editing on site? Well, if he's on a stage and he has his own trailer, we have a trailer right next to him. We work right there and he comes in when he wants and looks at material. And that's the way we did it work by very quickly. Is that what your process with him has always been, to be on location, to interact with him during production? Yes, he likes us there. He wants to see if there's anything missing or, or if he can enhance it and shoot something else. And as far as the workload, how do you divide the workload amongst each other? We don't. We share it. <laughs> you don't just do it different, you know, you take this scene, I'll take that scene, or you take these kind of scenes and I'll take this kind of scene? Well, we started that way, but after the first time we did it together, after the first movie, Sarah said, we ought to do this together. So that's what we do. We do it together. It works out pretty good. So literally together on the same avid or are there two different avids? How, mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. One avid. One avid. We sit next, we've got two keyboards hooked up to the same computer. I was going to ask what the unique properties of your setup was. That's certainly one of them. Well, it's a very big avid. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Yeah, we do have three computer monitors because we, we mirror the sequence on each side. So we have the sequence monitor in front of each of us and in the center we have where all of our bins are. Okay, and as far as the audio monitoring goes, I don't know how big the trailer is, but is it just stereo? Do you like to do LCR? Do you like to do 5.1? We're in LCR. We don't necessarily mix in LCR. We keep our dialogue in the center and then we keep the left and right for music because we have the channels hooked up to pods. So Stephen can control the mixing of the music as we play. He sits in between us. We all sit at the desk next to each other and that's how it goes. There's a lot of technical things we could talk about, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about crafting a story with the editors. An obvious place to start is at the beginning. The opening sequence, Sammy is going to see his first movie with his parents and there's a tracking shot of the audience lined up for the film. And we just hear Sammy talking to his parents about being concerned about what is this gonna be like? And the first thing we hear is his father talking in very technical terms about persistence of vision and how motion pictures work. And then, of course, his mother gets into the frame and her whole thing is about dreams and just about emotion. And so in that one very short section, it really does a lot to set up who these people are and how we're going to view Sammy and what this whole world is going to be like. Tell me about how you crafted that sequence. That was one of the easiest ones, Sarah, wasn't it? <laughs> I think it was. One take and then a cut away to her. <laughs> then he walked away. A couple of cuts, that's all. Those he cuts. <laughs> Pick the best take. That was what we did in that sequence. Well, okay, that's kind of nice when you have that wonder and there's not a lot of soul searching to do in that sequence. Yeah. In previous works, Stephen has done, the theme of divorce has been touched on, certainly in E.T. and also Catch Me If You Can. And because it is such a complicated theme... You know, when you're doing a, a big action movie, sometimes it's just the white hats versus the black hats, and you don't have to get into the nuance of the characters too much. But here with Bert and Mitzi, which are Sammy's parents, and then Benny, Uncle Benny, the one that's disrupting the marriage, 
it's very complicated to figure out how the audience should feel about a character. Is Bert wrong because he's not loving enough or emotional enough? Is Mitzi wrong for not loving Bert? Is Benny wrong for breaking up the marriage? Or is it D, all the above? And I just like to know how much, whether it was guidance from Stephen or just on your own, figuring out how to calibrate these characters so the audience feels the way you want them to about these characters. Well, the word you just said is what I believe. Feel. If we feel that something plays right, we go with it. If she or I do not agree with the way it plays, we'll play with it for a while. And then we'll give Stephen the version that we come up with. And he's very collaborative with us. Uh, he, he wants us to come up with ideas and, and to try different things. And, and we do that. Sometimes we find there's a scene we could lose. And, and we do. We take it out and see how that'll play. All throughout, that's the way it is. All the way through. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on what your background is, you might feel a different way about these characters. Did you find that you got different feedback from the people that you did share it with about, wow, geez, I really don't like Mitzi or, oh, I love Mitzi and I understand the pain that she's going through? Well, she's lonely. She has a nice husband, but she's lonely and she wants more activity from her husband. That's why she's attracted to Benny. Well, hard not to be. He's a fun character. Fun character and he's nice to be with. And, but the trouble is at the end when, when they're married, you know, Benny dies. It's not in the picture. But Benny dies, and then I understand that she and her first husband gets back together again. Now, I don't know this is a fact, but I infer that that's what happened, even as said. Well, the audience is aware that there's something going on between Mitzi and Benny before Sammy ever discovers it. And that's another very delicate thing that you do in terms of how long you let a glance play out, how long you let a look play out intuiting to the audience that there is something going on between Mitzi and Benny before Sammy's big realization in his editing of the camping film. Well, the looks to each other, Benny and the bomber. <laughs> one is this long, <laughs> and the other one is this long. <laughs> anyway, that's a Sammy. You want to say something about that? <laughs> yeah, I think it was really especially fun in that first dinner scene where we are setting up the dynamic to see how much, how much do we need of who is looking at who. We've got Benny, Bert... Mitzi, and then we've got Bert's mother as well, kind of clocking the whole thing. And, you know, I think it's interesting because I think we're you're trying to set up a friendship and a closeness, but I don't think anything's explicit until Sammy makes his discovery either. So you're kind of wondering, but you're not, you don't know for sure, I think. I would love to know your process for just how you organize all this material, the story elements of this. Are you doing three by five cards on the wall? Are you doing things within the Avid itself to try and not just manage the media, but really manage the story? It's much easier than you think. When he shoots Monday, we get Tuesday. And he looks at it, and the next day it's cut. Matter of fact, by the time he's still shooting, we have the whole show cut. So it's not a matter of us managing this or that. It's just of what we get together and see if he shares our feeling, because we don't always do exactly what he wants. We do what we feel he might, he might like. And we do have Pat and Andre and Matthias were organizing dailies for us to take to Stephen. So they would get all the dailies in a scene bins and organize them in frame view by cutting order. We'd call them chem rolls still, but they're avid sequences, but we call them chem rolls and we would take these rolls and that's what we would run with Stephen for dailies. So we have all the printed takes marked on our paper in case we want to check and see, but we generally run everything with Stephen. Do you use any tools like Script Sync to help organize the material or actually to edit from? We use Script Sync usually after the first, like we, we're usually, because usually, you know, they have a lot of dailies coming in, they're doing the dailies first. Script Sync is maybe done after the first cut is done, but we use it if we want to check something quickly. It's a, you know, it's a quick way to pop somewhere in a scene or if we want to check you know, like with the dinner table scene at the end, we had that scene, we had full shots of that entire scene from so many, you know, three cameras, so many different setups. So that was, if we needed a different line reading or something, it was really useful for that. But we don't use that for the first cut at all. How would you describe Stephen's shooting style in terms of number of cameras, kind of coverage? Usually one camera, but he does shoot two cameras on occasion. Sometimes if it's a big action scene, uh, we may have three cameras, maybe four. I don't think we've had more than three on any of these. On this one, the only thing that was tricky was when he was shooting the movies within the movies, because there might be a 16 millimeter camera and the 35 millimeter camera. And I don't remember exactly what they had there, but per sequence, really, it's per scene for how he shoots it. 
Something I thought was fun, the match cuts that you did. Typically, you would think those would have to be worked out ahead of time, especially when you have a sequence like Sammy and his father driving in the car, and it goes from watch the road, dad, to watch the road, Sammy, as Sammy gets his license and he's driving, and it's a nice effect for moving forward in time. When you have structures like that, does that limit your ability to play around with things and make changes because you have this thing that was shot specifically? That particular transition actually wasn't scripted that way. <laughs> really? It wasn't? No, that's a, that's no. amazing because that's pretty tight. How did you find that? Oh, that wasn't scripted, but Stephen said, try to, try to, try to use it. But now mm-hmm. the other guy is driving, you know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's a natural transition. The biggest thing in the show where you have so many short scenes is the transitions. That's very important. You can throw an audience right out of the window and you get lost if you don't really do that properly. And in this case, we were cautious about the transitions. Mm-hmm. There's a great bit at the end about the importance of the horizon. And when Sammy's father gives him the eight millimeter editor that he wanted, I think it's uh, Mansfield is the name of the brand. He asks Sammy to edit the footage of the camping trip they just took to cheer Mitzi up. She's grieving the loss of her mother. And the shots between Sammy and his father, Bert, they're just sort of back and forth over the shoulder shots. And Sammy protests that he's got his big war movie to shoot. And why would this cheer my mother up? And Bert delivers the line, because you made it for her. And then the next cut is to a low angle where Sammy is smaller in the frame and Bert is almost looking down to him, almost praying to him. You know, can you, can you help me here, Sammy? Going to that different angle all of a sudden, what does a shot like that say to the audience? And did you have other options there? Or was that always what was Stephen's intent to go to that low angle there for effect? Yeah. And that shot in particular, I think, does show as sort of like a shift in the, you know, it, you because you're with Paul in a different way or um, Bert you know, Paul, Paul Dano, he's, it's just sort of like, you kind of feel something a little bit different all of a sudden. Yeah. The idea is to put it together quickly and see where you're going for all of this stuff. So we'll try things. And it's a lot of fun to show them stuff that they didn't expect. Sometimes we win, sometimes you lose. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But no, he, he appreciates when we we fool around a little. If you talk about the overall show, if you see it as a whole show, it was so well planned because there's a huge amount of laugh out loud humor, a lot of that stuff. And then you get all this angst, all this drama at one place against the other. And comedy keeps coming in and it's a lot of fun for an audience to see that. But then you come to problems, you know. In the brief amount of time that we've been talking, I can't quite get a read on Stephen's style. On the one hand, I would almost imagine him to be quite meticulous in his approach. But to hear you two talk about it, he does sort of leave some things to chance and just to, you know, just see where things go. I think it's really depending on the film again. This film, I would say he was a lot, it felt a little bit looser than other films where we would, some scenes he would get really excited about and have like a specific idea about what, how he wanted to see a first cut, but not, not as many in this film. I would say a lot of times we would watch the dailies and talk about performances and, And then he would say, all right, let's just see what you do with it. And we kind of go from there. And it gives him space to, you know, obviously, since he's cutting right along with shooting, it gives him the space to go back and shoot something different if he wants to. Or, you know, we get to make a lot of discoveries while he's still shooting. Right. Mm. He shoots good coverage. And he goes over the scene by himself before he shoots it on the set. And when we get it, we like to know what his choices are. Not for a transition, but choices for, for takes. So you get to watch Sammy make a lot of fun movies in this film. His first film, a Western, delightfully titled Gunsmog, he looks at it and he says, oh, this is fake. This is totally fake. Until he discovers the power of score, of music, when he applies that to the film. He's like, this just elevated my film from something fake, to something that's actually moving this audience. And so I thought it'd be good to talk a little bit about your process with John Williams. When does he come into, pardon the pun, the picture? Are you working with temp score of his? Does he have stuff already almost finished for you to work with? How does that work with him? Well, I'll tell you, every show I've ever done with him, he won't look at it unless we put music in. It's not John Williams' music. It's just music. If he likes it, fine. If he doesn't like it, change it. Why? Because he doesn't want John Williams to to use that technique or that kind of music in the show. So if we don't do it good and he doesn't like it, that's good. If he does like it, that's good, too, because he knows which way to go. But Johnny doesn't get in with us until the cut is shown. Senator's List had a lot of music in there, and Johnny heard everything we put in, and he knew exactly what he wanted to do. 
I mean, Johnny could do it without us, you know. He, he's fine. Yeah, he's but, pretty good. But Steve likes to hear what we're putting in. And sometimes that takes longer to put it in than it does to cut the scene. Do you have a, a preference when it comes to, let's say, action? I know that some editors like to cut without sound just to get the picture cut temporally properly, and then they do sound. And then there are other editors that are like, no, I like to have sound. I like to have something to cut to in the process. Well, we always cut with dialogue, obviously. And then from there on, we add our once our first pass is done, we fill out with sound effects before we show Stephen we're not going crazy with layering backgrounds, but we're getting the key sound effects that tell the story and that are important to kind of have the right feel and tone and, you know, ideas from the scene. Well, there are so many scenes in the film that I could ask you to break down for me because there's so many great standout moments within the film. I tried to pick just one yeah. that we could focus on. And I think this one is sort of the linchpin of the whole movie. And it is the sequence where Sammy discovers the truth about his mother and Benny as he's editing the camping film. So you have footage of Sammy editing. You have the actual eight millimeter footage that Sammy is editing. His mother is playing the piano. So you have that score underpinning the whole thing. His father is listening to Mitzi playing the piano while he's working. I know it's not easy always to break a scene down and to describe your approach to crafting it, but I think that scene is a very important scene in the movie, and I'd just love to hear how you did it. We ran with Stephen, and he picked out what he'd like to use, the way he'd like to go. We cut out the pieces and patched it all together, put it all together. It's simplistic, isn't it? <laughs> you make it sound so easy. I'm sure it's a little harder than that. That was a beautiful scene to work on. Steven shot it so, you know, he got such a great performance out of Gabe. And I think that he moved the camera so beautifully in that scene. And the music is a gorgeous Bach piece that has a lot of emotion to it. And also the first time we did the first cut of it, the change in the music just happened to land right where he makes his discovery right. with the chords sort of slowing down and getting more minor and darker. And it was so powerful that we made sure that no matter what picture changes we did to that sequence, we always kept that chord change in the same place. You know, it was fun to do something that was about editing, where you have the character going through the footage, taking a yawn, and then all of a sudden something catches his eye and he becomes totally engrossed. There's an old Hollywood adage about working with children and animals, and you actually do both in this film. The kids are fantastic. Their, their performances are wonderful. But you have a monkey in the film, a real monkey, not a CGI monkey. Curious what kind of dailies you got back from that monkey and how much cutting around the monkey you had to do. The monkey was really well behaved. I mean... The monkey behaved as the monkey was supposed to behave, you know. And we had fun with it. That was a lot of fun. I kept asking Stephen, did this really happen? Each scene we ran with him, this really happened? Yeah, it really happened. He came home and there was a monkey in the house. And she was she was playing with it. She needed to laugh. And that was the whole idea of it. She, she needed that freedom to, to let go and enjoy herself. Just as a quick aside, I have to ask how often you might have turned to Stephen and said, wait a minute, did this really happen? Every scene, is this real? Did this really happen? Yeah, it really happened. It's fascinating to think that he didn't make it up. It was part of his life. <laughs> I'll go back to what I started with. This is, in spite of all that you have accomplished and done in your career, this is another first working with a director when it's his story, personal story you're telling. Easter eggs for Spielberg movies. I mean, beyond just the shooting stars, the scene where they're chasing the tornado. Yeah. And the shopping carts go flying down the road in unison. I got a real close encounters vibe off of that, where even the kids riding their bikes was very E.T. And I just wondered if Stephen is consciously doing these things, is sort of winking at his past projects. Well, he said to us that he wants the bicycle ride down because it does match the E.T. He told me it matched it. And he, liked, he liked that. Yeah. After all these films that you've done with him, are there ever scenes that evoke memories of past films where you're cutting a scene thinking, it feels like only yesterday I was doing this same scene in Lincoln or something? I don't know. It's always the same when I go into a film. I like to forget the baggage that's behind me. When I do a new film, it's like the first time I'm editing. When I'm through with these pictures, I, I really like to put it in the back seat. I don't like to think about them or be, or be stuck with any thoughts that I had when I was doing those films. They were difficult films, those action films. I bet they were. But I'll tell you what I did feel. <laughs> Out comes uh, the Hogan's Hero uh, shots. And he wants a job with this fellow, with the producer. The producer's talking to him. And at the same time that Steve was looking for the job, I was the editor on Hogan's Heroes. Oh, so at the same time Stephen was there at CBS, you were cutting Hogan's Heroes? Yeah. When was the first time you ever met Stephen? Was it Close Encounters or did you happen to meet him in other circles? 
No, he was looking for an editor. And I was one of the ones that came up and he met me. And I was comfortable with him. He looked, looked comfortable with me. Obviously, it worked out and you made an impression upon him. And so, Sarah, it's your turn. Same thing, meeting Michael and joining forces with Michael. What's what's the history there? I met Michael a long time ago. I don't know if I even actually really knew Michael in the first movie I worked on with him. I did know Michael. I don't mean to say that. But I just, you know, I wasn't working closely with him at first. I was I started as an intern um, on a very small movie called 10 Items or Less. And I had just got out of grad school and I came on and I was helping. They had gotten back from shooting Munich and I was helping out sort of like with all the mag and just organizing the cutting room and putting the music library in a, you know, in iTunes and that kind of thing and just trying to make myself useful. And, and, and then I, you know, I started to get to know Michael better on Spiderwick Chronicles. And then the first time we worked together at the Avid was for um, Tintin. That's when I really started to get to know Michael was on Tintin. Sarah, hearing you use the term mag, and you talked earlier about chem rolls, and uh, I didn't ask you about reels, but the whole movie is just a love letter to working with film. I would just like to know if there's anything you miss about the process of editing film or working in a film model. You know, I didn't get to professionally work in film. I, I got to do film at film school. I learned on the film before the Avid. I got to do it both in undergrad and grad school. So that was a treat. I was feel very lucky that I got to do that because I don't think that's around anymore. Um, and then I was around the film when they got back from Munich, but I've never worked in a film cutting room. So I sort of feel like I missed out. <laughs> You know, clearly telling his own story is a first for Steven Spielberg. The previous project that you all did, West Side Story, first musical, he's done obviously sci-fi, action, thrillers, biopics, historical events. The one thing I don't think he's done is a Western. And what's ironic is that the first film Sammy makes is a Western. Right. Do you think uh, there's a Western in his future or in your collective future? I think that might be, yeah. He's mentioned it a couple of times. It's the only thing he hasn't done. Well, I would like to see that. Is there anything else that either of you haven't done before, a genre that you would like to take on? No, I'm just happy with the one that's in front of me. Mm -hmm. The one that's coming through the <laughs> through the moviola, but we don't have a moviola anymore. No. It's the avid. I think by the time that people listen to this, the word is out that David Lynch is playing John Ford brilliantly. His only demand for Stephen to play the part of John Ford was that there were Cheetos on the set. Uh -huh. Is there anything that either of you require? I'll do your film, but I've got to have this in the cutting room. I've got to have this when I'm working. We used to have stuff in the cutting room. We had those root beer drops that we all liked. And then the company went out of business. <laughs> so, yeah, we always like to have something there for him. He likes to nosh a little. <laughs> well, you know, it was his birthday yesterday. You know, what do you get for the man that has everything? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what you get for the director who has everything. A fantastic cut of their movie. And Sarah and Michael did just that. So I guess they got him something after all. An enormous thank you to both Michael and Sarah for sharing their process and their experiences with us here today on The Rough Cut. I could not think of a better way to close out the year. Speaking of closing out the year, I gotta go. I hate to podcast and run on you, but the clock is winding down on 2022, and I got a few things to do. So do you. Like, go check out the latest with Avid Media Composer. Another new release is dropping, I think, tomorrow with some really cool things, especially if you work with Pro Tools. So click the link in the show notes and check that out. All right, bye for now. See you next year, all that stuff. Until next time, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. The Rough Cut.